Hey everybody, Dr. Dusa here with our good friend Lance Stranahan. Uh, again, I had a little bit of trouble um, uh, putting this uh, video up early today. So some of you may not have seen it. Maybe you see it now and hopefully you can come on and, and listen to what we have to say. And Lance, um, of course, is from the bodybuilding world. He's down in Florida and he's had a long history, but we're really going to talk more about his father, Frank Stranahan, because he is a man of renown, particularly played in the PGA uh, many years ago in the 40s. He was one of the pioneers. Um, he lifted weights as a kid, but he was the man who introduced um, weightlifting or weight resistance training uh, to the PGA. And we're going to talk about some interesting stuff about, you know, how he was kind of a contrarian and he was the only one doing something. And of course, nobody understood it. And he had to drive his his weights, 300 pounds of weights in his trunk around the tour and things like that. But then later on in life, um, he actually judged the Mr. Universe and he did some work with Joe Weider and a lot of the pro bodybuilders. And our friend Lance had a very rich and colorful upbringing growing up because he trained in his teenage years with guys like Mike Mentor, Boyer Co. Uh, stayed with John Grimmick at his house, um, stayed with Joe Weider, even went to the movies with him. And he's got a lot of studies. He's, he's had Hollywood stars come to his house when he's gone on walks and things like that. But it's all relevant to what we do here, longevity and having a well, a life well lived. Uh, and his father ended up uh, as a triathlete, uh, long distance runner, and he competed in bodybuilding. And Lance even um, did a guest posing. What year was that, Lance, the guest posing, you and your father? Oh, that was 1993. Right. That what, what show was that? Did you compete in that show too, or was it just a, just no, a guest posing? It was just a guest posing. That had to be really Father cool. Father and son. That's the one where you probably saw with the skit where he comes out with the cane. Yeah. yeah. And you know, injection and I'll tell you, for a guy, at, what, how old was he at that time? Uh, Seventy-three, I believe. And his skin was extraordinarily tight. The pec line was maintained. See, we understand this stuff. A lot of people don't, but. You know, it, I don't know if it was good genetics or he never gained a lot of weight in his life, did he? And then lost it. He pretty much stayed around a certain number or. Well, I'll tell you, for the most part, yes. Then uh, he got into this regime where he would actually do this fasting. And I'll tell you about that later on. But yeah, we'll, get, we'll get into that. Yeah. Right? But then he would drop a lot of weight in a short period of time, regain it. So he did actually drop sometimes 15, 20 pounds in a short period of time, then regain it, but never was fat. He was always muscular. So this is, uh, it was a strange thing, the fasting, but we'll, you know, talk about that. I know he learned some stuff from you. I was talking to John Defendis today and he's a little under the weather, but he told me he's going to try to join us here, maybe harangue us a little bit, but he, I, I know he was saying once that if he had you under his training auspices, he could have made you, yeah, I, listen, really, your genetics, I, I've said it many times, you look like, you know, if you pursued it full throttle, because you and I didn't, we did other things, yeah. hey, you could have been one of the national contenders, you had you had that, you know, and, and, and you know, defendants, defendants says he could have made me 280 pounds, I, I, I don't know how that would ever, I could never get over 186, but he, you know, of course, going down there, you may have to say goodbye to your family, you never see them again training with him. <laughs> well, he's, you know, I took it as a big compliment, and I probably... You know, should have worked with him. I, at the time, really wanted to uh, just do it on my own and all that. And uh, it was kind so of a... We'll, we'll talk about... Well, let's start how you grew up in Ohio. So how, how did it all start for you, uh, you know, with your father and growing up and, and training? And your father trained really young and so did you. So how did that all start out there? Ohio, right? What part of Ohio? Toledo. Toledo, Okay. So you grew up there. I grew up, I grew up well, until I was about six years old before we moved to Florida. But uh, I actually, I think I was, when I was five years old, my father had a gym in the house. It was like in the basement. We had a real large area that was converted into lots of things. There was a shooting gallery in this basement. Wow. There was a... As in, as in, as in, as in guns, real guns in the house. Yeah. Uh, little ducks, you know, that would go by. Oh. Shoot, uh, it was really interesting. The big sand <laughs> behind it, and uh, it's still there. Like people go and visit this place. Yeah, tell, uh, tell us, tell us about that. The significance, your family, your grandfathers. A lot of people don't know what they did. Your well, grandfather. 
that house uh, was my grandfather's house. And he was the person that, along with his brother, founded Champion Spark Plug Company. And that house, uh, after my grandmother died, the uh, my father didn't want to keep living there, and it was a very expensive to upkeep this house. It was a you know very sprawling, big estate, lots of land, and uh, so the state of uh, Ohio acquired. Lance, I will be uh, rude and, and, and periodically interrupt you for comments. The golfers used to say the bodybuilder Frank Stranahan. And the bodybuilder said the golfer strength, Frank Stranahan, LOL. Do you know John Williams? Uh, I don't know if I... Well, uh, I think he means well, but... Uh, point. Um, John, John... My father in his younger days was just known more for being a weightlifter. It wasn't until he was in his late 60s that I guess you could call him a bodybuilder. Bodybuilder. John, did you know, were you familiar from the media back then? You can let us know. You can write it in here. But go ahead, Lance. I'm sorry. No, so I was just saying the house actually now is like part of the Metro Parks in Toledo, and the, it's called the Manor House, and people get to tour around. And I've been back, you know, a few years ago. So the little, you know, a lot of the items are still in place, like the shooting gallery and wow. uh, all of that. But he had a gym in the, basically with a lot of Olympic weights, and uh, so he had me lifting since I was about five years of age. What did you think? Of it? What did you think of lifting? When did you even understand it at that age? Uh, it was just something I kind of like was like a chore, you know. I'd like three or four days a week, he'd call me in, and then it was basically doing uh, clean and jerks, deadlifts, squats, mainly kind of like powerlifting and Olympic style weightlifting. The idea was to just to get strong again, to be a golf, to hit golf balls further, because he started me at golf at about that age as well. That, really that, that, that video, that video of you with the blonde hair, you've got to be like three or something. Your like swing is like five, your, uh, five, your swing is like so per you know, guys that are fifty don't have a swing like that. <laughs> Were you ever told that you had potential like your father in golfing or not really? You didn't pursue it? Yeah, I mean I was uh, I won a lot of junior golf tournaments. I had um, you know quite a few trophies. Played on the golf team in high school. Uh, just uh, didn't really pursue it, I guess. With didn't really have that as my goal. To that, which when I look right. back, that would have been a good idea, probably. I'm sorry. So you can continue. So you visited the the manor, and are any of your possessions in there on exhibit or anything like that, or no? Or your father's no, trophies? Really. They actually did. Have, they do have a Frank Stranahan exhibit room there. Wow. So it has his memorabilia, it has a lot of his golf clubs, it has photographs of him playing golf, uh, weightlifting, all of that. So there is an actual room dedicated to uh, him and people when they go through there and tour the house, they see the, that wow. room. We've got John here again. Uh, he knows Frank only from magazines, he follow golf and also bodybuilding. So he saw your dad reference different ways from the two different groups. <laughs> We're going to have like a, a riot between bodybuilders and golfers, you know. Uh, sorry. It's like, unusual but, you don't really have that generally in golf. Uh, someone that also was involved, like he was, when he was on the golf tour, he was also competing in weightlifting events. Wow. Uh, now, what did his contemporary, how he golfed, uh, he was friends with Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas. What did, what did they or other guys think of that? Did they just not regard it or did they tell him it was wrong or? What were the yeah, a lot of people thought it was kind of a strange idea. Um, again, he was really ahead of his time. He started doing this back in the 40s. And as you know, back then, uh, even coaches of football players were against weight training. And most yeah. of the mainstream sports were against it. Yeah. And the belief of that time was if you're you know, throwing a baseball or whether you're throwing a football, that – lifting weights could make you lose your flexibility. They called it muscle battle was the term. Right. Yeah. So to do, to, if they were discouraging in that, you can imagine for golf, it would be unheard of. So my father said, you know, well, I believe that no matter what sport you're in, if you're stronger, you uh, are going to have an advantage. And he believed that if you're stronger, you could hit a golf ball further. So, uh, Lance, Lance, who helped him? Did any? Did he have like a mentor, like a Bob Hoffman or anything like that? 
Well, he corresponded a little bit with John Grimmick uh, back in, in the late 30s, early 40s, because he was reading Hoffman's magazines and some of these right. things. And uh, I think Grimmick was even lifted in the Olympics, if I'm not mistaken. He did. Yeah, he, did. Uh, he uh, got access to him somehow and wrote to him. And uh, I think he basically told him he went to a gym uh, in Toledo, a guy named Victorio who trained wrestlers and different people. And I think he's the guy, because I met him when I went up there. He's passed away in the last few years. But this Victorio, I think, was the real person that showed my father the proper form when he's doing the clean and jerks, uh, the snatch exercise, if you've ever seen that, and right. clean press and squats and deadlifts. So I think that's where he got a lot of that. And he didn't do a lot of bodybuilding exercises in the early days because he believed if you built your biceps too big or you overdeveloped your chest, that actually could impede your fluid golf swing. So most of this stuff was just done for like, like I said, deadlifts and squats to build the legs, back to shoulders, but without overdeveloping arms and, and chest. To backtrack, you, you had mentioned these we chat before we go on, but you and I talk anyhow. He said that your father actually started lifting. He was in football in high school, and the coach said you're just not big enough. So that's one of the reasons he really pressed on with that. That's right. how. He, so he continued. All right. He started, or you know, from the start was with the Charles Atlas course, which apparently right. he, got, he got some results out of it. It's uh, isometric exercise. That was a dynamic tension. They called it right. right. Angela. So he he did that with uh, Doc Tilney, who was the marketer for that. Uh. You know, the, the, the ad, remember the ad was, you know, kick the sand in the guy's face and you're going to punch you, but you're so scrawny, you'll dry up and blow away. That ad was probably one of the most successful ever. In well, apparently, and according to my father and other people that have done the course, when you would, this is just from the marketing standpoint, they say, oh, you know, the free course or whatever. Well, the, for the original course for those days was very expensive. Really? And even my dad that could have afforded it rather easily said, you know, that's a little... I think they gave some really like over the top price. And then when you refused, they kept sending letters back and lowering <laughs> the price. Lowering the price. Like, and after I think the third time he said, oh, okay. And he got the, got the course and it worked. And then again, you know, went from that to the weightlifting. You know, and, an, interesting, uh, an interesting side point. And you, you probably realize that I got to get out of this. I'm getting a reverb here. Um, that should help. Uh, I know, I know Bill Pearl, if your dad is trying to get feedback, I don't know why. You hear that? No. Maybe not. Sorry. Uh, Bill Pearl ordered uh, weights around when your father, probably right around the same time as your father ordering them, of course, and it took him two years because the war was going on and there was no steel. So if your father had tried to order something like that, it would have took him two years. He was probably better off with, well, you know, dynamic tension. Uh that's oh, sorry. But speaking of Bill Pearl, that was somebody my father was good friends with too. Wow. And Pearl wow. had a friend named Leo Stern and he was friends with both of them. Wow. And he told you, I showed you that book, The Keys to the Inner Universe that he sent us for free and autographed and all that. Huge, 600 pages, huge book. Yeah. Big book. It's got um, every exercise you could possibly think of. Everything, everything, and, and many that you've never heard of. <laughs> from what yeah, I've and then they're all illustrated, like with these drawings. There's like thousands of them. Ton, ton of work. Um, so, so continue on. So, your father, when did he? Uh, was he a college golfer, and he broke into the pros? Well, um, you know, even when he was 16 years old, he was winning like the. Uh, big amateur tournaments in Toledo. Uh, so when he was a teen, he was already winning quite a few of the bigger amateur tournaments. And in those days, uh, being an amateur golfer was actually more prestigious. Professional golf, they weren't really paying virtually anything. And it was a, kind of seen as a way for people to come in and try to make some money. But back in his day, when he was coming up, the best golfer was Bobby Jones. Yes. And Bobby Jones was never a professional golfer. Did your father know him? Oh, yeah. Wow. He, he, sure. So, you know, he started off and then he won all basically the big amateur golf tournaments, the British, o British Amateur, 
won that twice. The Canadian, the Mexican, the North and South. Did so you, all the didn't he say that tournament somehow over in Britain? Well, uh, he's uh, when he went over, um, and later on he played in the British Open. He was second in the professional British Open. Uh, they credit a lot from him bringing uh, American interest to that tournament. So, yeah, there's a, some stories about how he was responsible for more of the popularity of the British Open back in the, uh, you know, late 40s. Uh, he was also second in the Masters the same year. Who did your father, who did he think was the best golfer ever? I think he was really partial to Ben Hogan. Uh, Even more than Nicholas or Woods? Well, then, you know, later on, he really liked Tiger Woods a lot and uh, admired a lot of what Jack Nicholas had did, for sure. Right. Um, you know, I think Nicholas is probably the best of all time. When you look at all his, uh, his record of all the major wins. He has the most he, major wins. He has the most wins. major wins. Right. Tiger was on his way until he kind of got detoured a bit, but uh, Nicholas, I think, really for consistency in the most major wins. Now, your father on the tour, so how did he, he brought his weights with him, and how did the tour work? Was he on the road for a long time? Did he go from course to course or state to state? How did that work? Well, see, back then, not, er not every single town had a gym or a YMCA. Now let me just get this question in along with this because you answer it all in one shot. His, his eating, what was that like, especially on the road? Well, he back in the days he was on the tour and playing golf, he was, you know, he would eat healthy always, but he ate quite a bit of red meat, you know, and he'd eat natural foods. But, you know, he ate red meat and fish, all that sort of thing, uh, fruits, vegetables. Okay. So, uh, it wasn't until he got older that he became more of a vegan. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah we'll talk about that. Um, so what about the weights that he, that he carted around with himself and in the hotels and whatnot? Yeah, he had a limousine that they modified with stronger springs and shocks to accommodate like 300 pounds of weights. Wow. And the reason he had it driven around was that, uh, like I said, not all these – Towns had gyms in them. Some of them didn't have the YMCA. And he didn't want to ever miss, you know, he would train at least three days a week, even when he was playing in a golf tournament. He never would miss his sessions. So we wanted to make sure he always had his weights there. Now, if they had a YMCA or they had some place with weights, then he wouldn't need to use his. But I think he'd find out ahead of time that this town doesn't have a gym or whatever. And then they'd carry those weights and Sometimes they'd be brought up, yeah, into the hotel room and all that. Was he like on the Steve Reeves uh, whole body three time a week type of program? Because I know that's what a lot of those guys did back then. Well, again, they, they were more into bodybuilding, and his was more strength training for golf at that time. So it was three days a week, and he probably did a lot of the same exercises. It was probably you know, several sets of deadlifts, uh, several sets of squats, uh, presses overhead, clean and jerks. That's what I remember. What were his lifts? Did he have a lot of power or strength? Well, you know, he wasn't a real big guy. He was about 175, 180. But uh, on while he was golfing on the tour, he did 500. And in competition, he did 505-pound deadlift. He did the uh, clean and jerk, which is the overhead Right. A lift of 310 pounds, which is very good, actually. Very, uh, very, very strong. Squatted over 400 pounds. I think I think John Williams put up a, uh, a link, Ben Hogan and Frank Stranahan. Maybe those are pictures uh, or something that's. Okay. People can visit that, I guess. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Thank you. John, John is that a picture of Frank with uh, Ben Hogan? You can let us know. Sorry, Lance, you can continue there. No, that's good. So, he had uh, so yeah, I mean, pretty good lifts for a person that's uh, on the golf tour. And you mentioned, you mentioned Gary Player. Right. Gary Player is someone that was interested in fitness, too, who was a great golfer. And he always credits my father as mentoring him into uh, working out. 
he didn't lift really the same type of heavy weights, but he he was pretty strong and he did a lot of calisthenics and and I don't know exactly the routines he did, but he's always been really gracious and I've met him several times and just an incredibly nice guy, and great golfer, one of the best that, that ever lived. And, is he, uh, is he South, South African, Lance, or is yes. he American? He is. South African. Gary Miller, a really good member, really good contributor, and a hell of a physique back at, well, even still, Gary. I've worked with several pro and amateur golfers. Definitely, as always, weight tra training helps athletes. Awesome discussion, referencing your dad. It's, Thank it's, you. It's very, very interesting stuff, Gary. I love this stuff. It's history. And we have Lance right here. He's a part of it. Um, so, so he helped, he actually helped Gary play with training and Yes. Yeah, and they stayed friends for, you know, their whole life as in, until my dad passed away. You know, that, that, uh, your father passed away like five years ago? He lived into his 90s, right? Yeah, 2013. And he trained right to the end almost. Yeah, I took him. I'd work out with him like twice a week and take him to the gym, uh, even in when he was 90. Wow. Wow. Uh, so when did his golf career end, and what did he do after that? Well, speaking, uh, speaking about his education, though, he, did, he did a very high level of education, and, and also his service in the, in the military in World War II. If you could talk about that a little bit, education and, and military service. Yeah, he was, um, well, um, he enlisted in the Air Force in 19, uh, I believe it was at the end of 44, and he got trained and certified to fly a bomber. And uh, the war ended really before he got sent over to Germany or any of these places, but uh, they were definitely gonna use him for that. Uh, so, wow. and uh, I have some pictures. He, I, there, there's one picture somebody sent to me of uh, when he was training in Miami in a plane and apparently the plane started going down and he had to bail out and parachute wow. and so i have a picture of this like crashed plane that wow and the guy and the guy who wrote it said this is the one you barely got out of frank uh, <laughs> so uh but yeah he, he stopped uh playing golf kind of retired in 19 probably 62 i think it was and that's when right, he right, started, right, 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 right. yeah right <laughs> i was the uh third son that he had Okay, okay. I had a brother that was five years older and one that was seven years older. Uh, so yeah, he, and he decided to go uh, back to school and he went to Wharton uh, and got his master's degree of finance there. Wow, and wow. Uh, we studied some time before that at Harvard. So, wow. uh, And then opened a big stock broker uh, firm in uh, Manhattan and did, uh, it was called Stranahan Investments. Had that going for several years. Wow, wow. Now, how did he run into all of these uh, these these figures in bodybuilding and eating in Hollywood? I know he, if I may mention, he went, he went out with Tim here from uh, Gilligan's Island. Didn't he? Oh, uh, yeah, Tina Louise, who played Ginger. Now, how he he, I guess he was knew some people in Hollywood. Like one of his friends was a producer, but. I'm not sure exactly how he got introduced to her, but he, uh, before, like I'd say a couple of years before he married my mother, uh, one of the people that he dated for a little bit was Tina Louise, who played Ginger on Gilligan's <laughs> Island. And uh, I didn't even know it until I was watching it one day. And then I, he mentioned to me uh, the story. And oh, when you were so, watching uh, it? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, so he knew Bob Hoffman well and John Grimmick and all uh, those guys, but he also met Joe Weider. And I think in 1957, Joe Weider put him on the cover yep. of his Muscle Builder magazine back then. And it's, there's a cover with him with the sword and there's a big, I I yeah. yeah, there's an article about him on there. So he uh, became pretty good friends with Joe Weider and they spoke for many years. Before you and, go to the show, mention Bob Hoffman, you actually stayed at John Grimmick's house. First Mr. Well, America. I was doing uh, 
pretty good weightlifting by the time I was 14, even though I was really pretty small. I was only weighing 128 pounds and pretty short. But uh, my father, because I was starting to get interested in reading the magazines and muscular development, he said, how would you like to go to York, Pennsylvania and stay with John Grimmick? And they, you know, they have a weightlifting platform in there at the, uh, the York place, which they did. And, you know, he would work with you and maybe... So I went up there and I stayed with John Grimmick and they... And Did you meet Hoffman? Oh, yeah. Did you? I didn't, he didn't say a whole lot. He just came in one day. He wasn't there a lot. But this was, you know, they had the York offices and yep. they also had a weightlifting platform in there. Was uh, Hoffman imposing or how did he impress you at all? Well, he was pretty elderly by then and just... Didn't seem real personable, I guess, but he, he, he was friendly enough. But Grimmick had a great personality. He was very outgoing, uh, uh, very modest, you know. At this time, he was like 70-something years old. I forgot, 71 or two. And he was big. I mean, he had to weigh 220, and he was not a real tall guy. And he had, you know, he wasn't ripped or anything, but he was solid, and he had easily 19, 20-inch arms. And, but, and I kept trying to get him to flex for me or show me something. And he finally rolled up his pants and like flexed his calf. And it was just incredibly gigantic. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that. He told me you were in the meeting post and he did that for you. Like, oh. <laughs> or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he worked out a little bit one day and he still was hoisting some pretty heavy weights and everything. Lance, how about when he took you to, how about when he you to keep pumping on you? And huh? you, want, you want him to come in, what did he say? Oh, the movie? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this the movie Pumping Iron had just opened. I happened to be in Pennsylvania, and I said, I asked him, would you like to go see it with me? You know, I figured he'd love to see it with Arnold's in it and all that. And he said, I'll take you to the theater. And I thought, okay, great, he's going to go see the movie with me. So he, I buy the ticket, and he says, uh, I'll come back and pick you up when the movie's over. And I said, what do you mean? You don't want to come in? He goes, I don't want to watch those weeder boys. He goes, I have no interest in that. I said, really? And I saw the movie, and it just, like, mesmerized me, you know? Was that the first time you saw it in the theater? Yeah. No kidding. Wow. So the next day, I asked him, I said, this movie's so great. Will you come along and... Can I get you to see it? And he kind of acted like, all right, mate, because I told him it's so cool. And, you know, yeah. Lou Ferrigno's in it and everybody. And he gets up there, and then once again, he won't go in it. So I saw the movie two days in a row. And John Grimmick. But when he came in the theater, believe it or not, some of the bodybuilding fans recognized him, and he started <laughs> signing autographs. And they were, oh, even though he wouldn't sit through the movie, they were asking for his autograph. And I'm sure he was in something eventually, maybe, or maybe not. <laughs> so that was when I was like 14 years old. Okay. It was like 1978, I think, or 77. It was like 77, right before, yeah. Now, so, did, you, did you see Reader right after that first, the menu with Mentor all those guys, or how did that come Well, out? what happened is after I saw Pumping Iron, I really got seriously interested in bodybuilding. Remember, before that, I was just doing weightlifting right, right, and right. strength training. So uh, now I was uh, really got into the bodybuilding, and I was really reading Joe's magazines. So my thing was I wanted to go up and see the Mr. Olympia. Wow. And that's the 77 Olympia. So my father said, okay, and he took me, and we went and saw it. And Joe uh, Arnold was promoting the contest. So not only did I meet Joe Weider, I got to meet Arnold, and Joe and Arnold had me go backstage with my dad. And I met Robbie, and uh, and Menser was there. He wasn't competing in it. Hold on, I, man. What, what, was your, what was your first meeting as soon as you met Arnold? What was your impression? Did he talk to you or acknowledge you, or you just oh, a yeah. And he remembered my dad because my father had, Joe Weider had my dad judge the 73 Mr. Olympia contest in New York. Wow. wow. And I used to see a picture of dad, my father shaking hands with Arnold and Franco. Uh, and this was when he judged the contest and he had a great picture from that. So he remembered him from there. And I guess, uh, 
I, I didn't know at the time, but I guess he had some ideas. He wanted to do business with him or something. So, but uh, Arnold was very friendly. He was busy, but he was very friendly, and we got to go backstage. And uh, so it was really a, that's the year Zane won. Your impression was that was that a worthy win for Zane? Huh? People, people, people still say Robbie should have won, but did Zane win that for you? Really? In your your in your opinion? Yeah, I thought Zane deserved to win for sure. And I thought Robbie, as great as he was, he wasn't uh, at his best in that show. Uh, he just wasn't, he was smooth, basically. He just didn't, he mistimed his peak. But, it, you know, if you saw the magazines leading up to that show. Uh, oh, yeah. He looked amazing, remember? I mean, that was probably, leading up to that show was the biggest and ripped that you've ever seen him. And everybody said no one's going to come close to Robbie. But somehow, I guess he peaked a little too soon. And by the time of the show, he had lost some ground and Zane peaked quite well. So, And so then I came back the next year and it was very similar, I went backstage. And then uh, my Joe father Weider. talked to Mentz, uh, Joe Weider, and I got to spend uh, some days training with Mike Mentzer. I went to California. Wow, what was that like? It was great. Uh, this was around seven, 1978, and this is when he had just come back from losing to Cal Scalac in the Mr. Universe in France. And uh, it was great. I, I stayed with him for about almost a week at his apartment with his girlfriend, Kathy. And he took me through several workouts, and we talked a lot about nutrition and training, and it was for a teenager, it was really cool. And then I spent some time with Boyer Co. Right. In Louisiana. I got to train with him for a few days. And again, that was around 78 or 79. So really had some great experiences. Did Mentor talk about his losses, like to Scholic or anything? Or did he just even talk about it? Or? Uh, I think he believed that he should have probably won. He felt that Scalic was great upper body wise, but you know, his legs, his right. legs weren't quite up to par. Right. But right. I think, I think Scalic, you know, really, they, they judged it kind of strange. And they, back then they would put a lot more emphasis on those final pose down rounds. Yes. Yeah. Whereas now there's not much scoring, I think in that at all. And I think Scalic really came alive and had a lot of charisma and just posed incredible. And I think that's some, reason why he probably won but yeah, uh, yeah. I but this wasn't that. this wasn't the mentor that you read about later on that after the 80 olympia got very bitter and disillusioned he was very like this is when he had his mail order courses making you know a fortune yeah. and he was really starting to be the rising star and he was just extremely positive really really was a great time to you know in his life uh, but later on, I think definitely losing that show. And Gary's granddad and brothers were all golf pros. Swope Park Golf Course, Kansas City. Lawrence, Kansas City Country Club and golf coach at KU University. Your dad may have passed through their courses. Could have been. And then yeah. awesome Ginger, the 1960. <laughs> reading Gary's post is like reading, like, the, the, the blurbs on the cover of People magazine, which is a good thing, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> another, another awesome experience, Jeremy and Hoffman. Uh, John wants to know, we're going to talk about that, John. His father did run marathons. Yes. And uh, one of the two marathons. marathons. Yeah. yeah. What a blessing to have access to the He didn't start yeah. running until he was about 47 years old. And oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so this one is to Gary Miller. What a blessing to have that access to the from your dad, right? Right, Gary, as long as you're not getting the wrong advices, which I don't think the guys did for me. <laughs> did you pick up, do you remember actually picking up anything that stuck with you from Mentor or Co, like they really gave you? Because you know there's really no secrets, but being really young, maybe you were doing things wrong. Did they illuminate differently for you at all that you remember? Uh, well, you know, I, Again, Mentor, I, I was really a big believer in not doing a lot of sets. Uh, and he actually showed me, I guess the thing I really picked up to him is, what is a high intensity set? What is it like to 
train till you can no longer move the weight and even have some force preps, do those rest pause yeah. sets where you do uh, like you're on a, they're best on a machine really. Like if you were doing a machine uh, exercise and then you would only rest for a few seconds and get out a couple more reps and a few seconds, pull some weight down. So I learned pretty early on what real intensity was, you know, and that, uh, so I think I got that from him and the Boyer Co. Uh, another guy that trained really, he trained really fast and really, you know, he had good form. He trained pretty heavy. Uh, I, I remember that he would make protein shakes. So a lot of people say, oh, these guys just, you know, he had his own brand of protein powder. It was called right. Amino Bond, and it tasted fantastic. But uh, he he was a, he wasn't. It was a strange diet he was on to me. It was a very low carbohydrate <laughs> diet, but he would eat, he would eat fried chicken every day. Yeah, <laughs> right. How did he explain that to you? Did he explain it? I don't know, but he got really aggravated when I started. I had, I was really hungry one day, and I grabbed some Cracker Jack out of a vending machine. And believe me, I hardly ever eat junk food because my dad would never let me. And he said, how can you eat? And Boyer Co. said, how can you eat that? That's the worst thing in the world while he's eating the fried chicken, you know, because <laughs> it was sugar and carbohydrates. And, you know, you, you know, know I'm I'm that's Junior was telling me when they were filming Pumping Iron Man, they were at half the house. And Mike was almost like seven years old. And Robbie Robinson was staying at the house, and Mike Jr. gets up and he's eating like Apple Jacks, and Robbie just comes in the kitchen. He's like, "You ain't gonna get food eating that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, very similar. Just at him, you know. But you know, growing up like that, I guess Arnold and Frank are slept over, and Mike walked in the room, and Arnold was naked, changing, and Mike just ran and slammed the door. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of shocking when we were a kid. Um, so how about Joe? Joe Weaver, you stayed at his house and met Betty, and she was looking great. And you went to the movies with Joe, too? Yeah, I got to stay uh, for a few days with Joe Weaver at his house. Uh, it was really nice. He put me up there and uh, got toured around the Weaver offices, all those big paintings. and wow. the uh, ones I just sent you. The ones I just showed yeah. It was a great time and had lunch with him and Armin Tanny. Oh, good. Which was, do you remember him? Oh, of course. Wait, let me ask you a question. When you were there, John Defendant, we're going to get on him in a second. When you were there, when you were with Weeder, when you were in Woodland Hills, when you were with Co. Menser in John Grimmick's kitchen, the platform at York, did you know the significance of being around all that at the time, or was it just something you know your father had you do? You know, because you did read the magazine, you were kind of part of that world. Well, you know, I, my father always had these magazines like in big stacks. So even when I was a little kid, I uh, I was always reading muscular development, strength and health, and muscle builder. So I knew a lot of you know I knew who John Grimmick was. I, I so. Yeah, it was a pretty big deal to me. Uh, and after, you know, seeing Pumping Iron and all that, definitely. And But I read these magazines for years, so I was pretty aware of all of those people. Do I look back now and as it, it seems like, yeah, it was a great experience. But I did appreciate it at the time. I definitely did. That's important because a lot of times you're going through things and it's good, but you're always waiting for those better times of sometimes... Well, it was kind of a thrill because when I was up there at 14, they uh, Grimmick and everything, they put me in the magazine and did a whole article. It was called Like Father, Like Son. And it's in an issue in 1977, Roy Hilligan's on the cover. And it shows me doing the clean and jerk with a pretty heavy weight and deadlifting. And it's uh, they did a whole article about how my father lifted weights and golf, and then it had me lifting weights and playing golf. and. Was that uh, what the crusher? Was that you had thing with crusher? No, uh, that wasn't in the magazine, but uh, okay. that's a good yeah. picture too. <laughs> but uh, uh, Gary, Gary wants to know what happened to Armin Tanny's son. He looked great too. I think he got sick or something. I don't remember. Uh, I don't know how he died exactly. Yeah. Oh no, that was Vic Tanny's junior. 
I don't know who Armin Tanny's son was exactly. John Defender, fourth most, <laughs> fourth most <laughs> trainer ever. I was 20 minutes away from Cranahan. Cranahan never came to see me. Well, I'm, I'm eight hundred miles away, so I got a good excuse. Like, what the f? We're supposed, we're both supposed to go down there and have the screening chariots of fire experience, aren't we, Lance? To defend us. <laughs> Well, I, I, I would see him usually backstage at a contest I was in while his guys were winning. While his guys were winning. and uh, Huh? No, no, you're competing in Florida. And John's like, come under my umbrella. I can help you. Because his guys are beating you, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the few shows I went in, I definitely would like come in second or third to them or something like that. And uh, I kept thinking, well, if I just do things right, I'll probably get to beat his guys. And that'll be a big thing if I beat his guys. It should have occurred to me, why not just join them instead of trying to beat them, which was kind of like, I didn't have the intelligence or the knowledge to know that if somebody's really an expert at something and they're producing results in other people and you can visually see the results and his guys were shredded beyond belief, I mean, and I should have been able to put together that, you know, I don't know it all. I would probably benefit from that, but my brain didn't work like that, I guess. You know, two things. You'll tell me in a second, because you did tell me in the past why you didn't join. Defender says, and I'll, you know. But there is no real good reason. I've cut down on my swearing. We will be a southern motherfucker. But no, I will say two things. You did mention why you didn't join. We'll talk about that in a second. But I do remember when I was about 21 up here in Connecticut, a friend of mine who now lives in Florida, as we were like 40, said the guys in Florida. That was back at the time. You know what? I, I could give you some real complex psychological reasons. Yeah, but because I, I, yeah. Let me explain this real quick. Back then, this was when if you won the Mr. California like Brignoli did, you were the guy who was probably going to win the Mr. America. That was not, And Florida was the other hot plant, and then a couple other states, certainly not Connecticut. But I remember in Connecticut that we knew in Florida the guys got inc exceptionally shredded, like beyond. And it was probably talking about, you know, Defendus's crew right there, what he did. But you I'm did. Sure it was. You gave a reason why you didn't join up with him. What was that? You, 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 you know, I, I just felt like one of the reasons I got with so into bodybuilding is that I I, I kind of like that over team sports. And I always felt like if I join up now, I'm back to being on a team again. And I always felt it was kind of like a self thing. But again, that was a foolish, probably a foolish thing. If I wanted to really excel and keep going in that, that would have been the smart thing to do, would have been to go with someone that's getting results and is an expert themselves and you know, you know there was no of, doubt that people that he trained got into fantastic shape. I mean, just very much. I would get pretty lean, but not to the degree they had the polish, like he would say, that last little dimension that just well, John, John, really John, worked. John, he says that you probably don't want to do 400 tests. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll keep, I'll, 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 I'll keep you out of this statement. Myself, John, and a couple other people we were talking about you, and you may have been there with us, but if you did go with John and if you committed 100% and didn't go into what you did for business and whatnot in school, yeah, you had you had good where you could have been, you know, a national contender if you did join and, you know, pursue only that. I don't like that word, but you know. Uh, well, I think to be... <laughs> John... The Lance and I are not in that 600 number, so we're kind of on the outside of that little bubble. Lance would have been a pro. Really, you really think so, yeah. straight up? Pro, like an IPB pro. And, and, and is that when, and is that when, you know, because how, how heavy would Lance have been at his best? Is he competing? Would he compete in 170s, Lance? Um, well, one year I was up to 190 in the light heavyweights. Okay, so, but uh, you know, I, I think to do anything to that level, you have to first decide that's exactly what you want, and you have to be very clear on that. If you said, you know, I want to be 
uh, that that I, my goals at that time were, I'd like to just win the West Palm. I didn't really think beyond that. Like I, I'm, I thought, you know, to do what it would take to win a national level show or Mr. Florida, I didn't know if I was ready to want to do that, but you have to know exactly, you know, have that goal. You have to otherwise, you know, an IPB pro and it actually meant something. I would have had Lance at 215, 220 shredded. John, would he have like a Porter Cottrell or something like that? That's what I envision him like. Like a Porter Cottrell or a Charles Claremont or somebody like that. What do you think, John? Let us know. I'm glad you're here, John. Thanks for coming on. I know you're a little under the weather. Uh, but we appreciate you. A guy like you, I mean, you had, you had a lot of you know, yeah, most of the value. Doing. But uh, thank you, John, because that's a tremendous compliment coming from you. And, you know, I take that as a tremendous compliment. Thank you very much. Lance had better shape. Lance had better shape than Porter. Yeah, I might agree with that. And, John, uh, well, before we get back to John, hey, Lance, I'm going to ask you a question, a general question about your father. You had perfect shape. I'll tell you this, John. He probably has incredible symmetry. John, I'll tell you what, he's probably got some of the best calves that I see on the internet, you know, anywhere. Of course, I have if I didn't have veins, I wouldn't have legs. So <laughs> incredible symmetry. Um, I have Thank you, of, John. I really appreciate that. Your, your father, let me ask you something. Just ask a question about your father. Was he an exacting man, would you say? Exacting. Uh, well, my father really believed in two things, commitment and discipline. Uh, and so he was exacting because he believed that to be great at anything, you had to work very hard at it, harder than just about anybody. And you had to have a commitment to that. Because if you're not committed, when you have a little bit of a problem or you have a, uh, a little setback, you're going to give up. And he didn't believe in that. And he and he was very disciplined. So he was demanding as far as I had to do his regimes. You know, I had to work out when I was a kid, even as a kid growing up, had to play golf, uh, had to eat no junk food or I'd get punished. So John, John is a kind of bodybuilding and he doesn't go here. We know that. Hey, hey John, did you think, did, did John train me? What? Did, did John defend his train, your father? Yes, my dad, when he started getting into competing in his late 60s, uh, thought that since, since he had seen when I was competing that John's guys always did so well, he went and uh, on his own accord, looked him up, and uh, the times that my father, remember, was it wasn't the easiest guy to work with because he was always on a vegetarian diet. Right. And he had his own way, and he wasn't the type that liked to switch, but there was... Uh, a few shows where he did exactly what he said. He said, all right, I guess I don't want to eat all this chicken and the sweet potato and this, but he followed his routine a hundred percent and he got into really great shape for the ones that he worked with, with John. And he, yeah, he won the nationals all over 60 and the over 70, I believe. Lance, your father, that, that work ethic in that, you know, that tenacity, where did that come from? Did it come from his father who started the champion bar club company? I think he got a lot of it from there. And I think that's a good point because a lot of people that grew up, he grew up, I'll be honest, in a pretty, uh, pretty extravagant house and everything. And a lot of people in that position, and you can see it all around you, a lot of times the sons don't really have that work ethic. They are comfortable. There's not a lot. And he never had that. He never cared about anything to do with luxury. None of that interested him. He was interested in competing and being the best and working hard at goals. And even when he was older, he always lived very modestly and material things meant absolutely nothing to him. I mean, people would go into one of his houses. There wouldn't be any furniture. He'd have weights and he had weights in the middle of the room. And you can ask anyone that knew him. And there wasn't really hardly any furniture. There'd be a little TV set, a little kitchen table, and that's just who he was. Um, so he wasn't like a lot of people that came from his background as far as, you know, they want to just be the spoiled playboy type of guy. He just, you know, when he played golf, he'd practice all day long. 
And when the uh, sun went down, he'd shine his car lights on a putting green and practice putting for hours at night. And when he ran and he started doing his marathons, he'd get up every single night, and this is in his 60s and 50s, at 3.30 a.m. and run a minimum of 10 miles uh, and often 18 miles, and that's how he ran 101 marathons. Lance, I'm a bit bit, bit frightened only because I myself, when I had my condo, my practice, I worked so much that I didn't buy a bed for six months. I had a bed in my house. Oh, I didn't have your father. Yes, so I guess I can't frighten. Maybe I just, it was a bum. I don't know. You know, as far as not having any items. But I can appreciate that. So I mean, when my mother, when my mother was alive, there was a little bit more furniture because she didn't have exactly the same type of thing. You know, I mean, when she passed away. Uh, and I was 15 years old, my father had what's called an indoor driving range in our house. And instead of a living room, there was like a driving net where you hit the golf balls right into the net. And then his office, which had his stock machines, that was like a complete home gym with lat machines, barbells, everything. He almost almost sounds like like the fantasy buddy, Mihalik, who had a a Stanley Cap range machine in his bedroom. And he'd get up twice a night to eat and do his calves. Don, <laughs> I've read that in Don. Don actually has a couple of statements. He wants to know, did you did you know your grandfather well and what was he like? And then let's just go to John here. Did, I, ever meet, did you ever meet Keith Fairwater? He was a PTA Tour pro. He was in the lifting. I think he's four years older than you. So you can answer both of those. All right. Well, John, to John's question, no, I never met my grandfather. He died a few months before I was born. So I've read about him, and I know stories from my father, So, uh, but I never personally met him. And no, I don't know the other gentleman because I haven't followed a lot of the... Uh, I don't know Keith, I don't think. Um, I, I don't know him. I think a lot of the people now, most people do. You know, everybody, you know, back when we started, Hillary by people for lifting, but now everybody's a big time pro. Um, and your father was Mr. America over 70. I know he won the shows, right? Yeah, he won the over 60 nationals at 69. And then I believe he also, like John said, won the over 70 division in the Masters Nationals or the Nationals. Uh, uh, what did his. um? So how did he, so he was a vegetarian when he was competing as a bodybuilder. He wouldn't do any animal well, prep. Well, actually, up until then, uh, he actually, thanks to me, suggesting that maybe he should eat a little animal protein if he was really going to get serious about the bodybuilding. So I originally, he was only eating like raw potatoes, raw corn, nuts, seeds. For many years, he was a real health fanatic. But... Between that, the running, everything, he was, and he'd lift weights, run all day, so he was just always in a catabolic state, in my opinion. You know, he would, you know, just do so much and then not eat any protein. So he used to walk around weighing 150 when, when he was on the golf tour eating meat, he weighed 180. He was much bigger when he played golf. John, John, I'm sorry, your grandfather must have been an amazing man. I wish you and I had both met him. Your grandfather would give a reflection of you and your father. Man. That's a Thank really you. nice word right there. And then John, but getting back, oh, go ahead. Keith Clearwater was a moderately successful golf pro more in the late 80s, early 90s, one of the rare tour pros back then with the bodybuilder look. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe, they, maybe they held out of hand, John. Who knows? <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, but yeah, uh, like when his mid sixties, I got him to start eating some fish and things, and the effect was almost miraculous. He put on like about eight or nine pounds of muscle, uh, and just got a lot stronger, looked more healthy, younger. So I know I know some vegetarian diets, some people do well with them, but he, I I think you know with all the training he was doing and all the running and just uh, I didn't think it was the right way to go. And then John put him on some of his eating plan, and that's when he really got into great shape. Lance, how about you? Your father had you on a similar program, and he said that you 
experience growth both when he started eating protein as a kid? Well, you know, I know he meant well, and because he had lost his first son to cancer, and he really got really into the vegetarianism, and I was like forced to eat, you know, raw fruits and vegetables, and I wasn't allowed meat, I wasn't allowed any milk. And by the time I was 13, I really think my growth was stunted. I think I was, you know, I was always the shortest kid in the class. I was like 5'3 or something, very small. And after I saw Pumping Iron, after I started really getting into bodybuilding, and I just said, you know, Dad, I'm going to eat what I want. I started eating ground sirloins and eggs. And I got up to like 5'9", and I put on a lot of weight, and I changed. But I really think that diet... I was on really stunted my maturity and, and everything. I mean, so because we think about it, there was no milk, there was no protein, there was nothing. It was raw corn. I would have to eat raw potatoes, uh, nuts. And so when I finally rebelled and ate meat and everything, I got to at least a normal height and everything. I think you snuck out and once your spaghetti or something, right? Well, I used to like to eat spaghetti now and then. My mother, when, you know, we, we used to go to Italy in the summer and we'd go to Italian restaurants where my father would go to sleep at night. So I would now and then, I, I just had a real love for spaghetti. And so I would, yeah, sneak out at night and go to Testa's and one of these restaurants in Palm Beach. And you come up here, like, I'm out of a and grits. It tastes really good spaghetti. This in particular was great. And in fact, um, Italy, uh, Denise would love that. <laughs> uh, Lance, uh, John says, I bet Lance is a talent of the figure right now. <laughs> Lance, no, how I, about the stars? You, 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 had, you know, you ran into, you, you had an experience with, um, I think it was uh, Al Pacino one night. He was walking along with you or something, came to your house. Oh, it's just the thing I ran into. No, it was Dustin Hoffman. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, you know, just, you know, he, I ran into him at this restaurant. I was 14. He had a beard. No one really recognized him. He was with his two daughters. I just went up to him and started talking to him. I was probably like 15 or 16. And he happened to be staying at the Breakers Hotel, which is near where I lived. And then he walked all the way over there. And I had walked from my house to go there. So I, you know, I walked back with him and I actually brought him in my house. And we have a home gym there. And the guy started doing chin-ups and using my lab machine. And then I had my dad come in and he goes, and my dad didn't even recognize him at first because, again, he had a big beard and everything. But what he did he say? Who the hell was that? And then afterwards, my dad said, geez, he's just a tiny little guy. And I said, yeah, but he's a big movie star, you know. And, and But he, he was doing, like, using all the equipment. He really loved the home gym we had there. And uh, his daughters were nice, but... Really cool guy, and I was telling you the story how a few months later, strangely enough, going to California by myself on a 747, I went up into the cocktail lounge, and there's Robert De Niro. And now after this great experience with Dustin Hoffman, I figured, ah, you know, I'll say hi. And I, I just said, oh, yeah, Robert De Niro, he was by himself. And he looks up at me, and he just, like, shakes his head, and he didn't, want, didn't, didn't even acknowledge me. You know, he was really unfriendly, so... Uh, but we, uh, we, we kind of have some that uh, uh, acidity today with him. You know, he's just not a happy guy. But that's a different. Uh, uh, Johnson Mario Boca is the greatest dance. Have you been there, Mario? Uh, no, I don't think I have. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, so. I got I wonder if it's still there. I'll check it out. So we got it. Some Italian, a little bit of Italian uh, genetic material in the bloodstream, and they'll be able to find these places. You know, well, I hear down in Florida though, uh, John John asked the engineer is an ass. <laughs> John's here to add some clarity. I know. Uh, well, John's been great. Thank you for being on here, John. I, I got my. I name. wonder, Ed, with John, has he heard my Arnold story backstage? Oh, oh no, you, you got you've got to mention that, but. I've got my new saw, you know, I'm wearing a tie. I'm trying to be a little more erudite, yeah. less swearing. So we bring Defendus in to, to lay down the, you know, <laughs> go there, Lance. It's one block east of, um, you're getting me hungry, John. I had like a turkey sandwich tonight. One block I will check it out. Mario's and Boca. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Yeah. Did, did, did you tell us, yeah, what happened with the third year? You get back to your cycle. Okay. You want the story real quick? Yeah, please. Okay. 
So as you know, I, uh, 77 Olympia, I meet Arnold. He knows my dad from judging the 73 Olympia. He has me go backstage. I meet everybody, all the competitors. It's just incredible moment. 78, uh, you know, Joe Weider's there and everything. Oh yeah, come backstage. And, uh, and then I was in California and Arnold saw me in the locker room at World Gym. And he said, I remember you, you're Frank Stranahan's son. I had to tell your father to call me. I need to talk to him about something. You know, so my father, he, he called, he actually called the house. And I answered and he's like, hi, this is Arnold. Uh, let me speak to your father. And I, I went, Arnold, oh my God. You know, he's like my hero back then. I idolized him from pumping iron and I put my dad on and I'm kind of listening and he's telling my father that he has this film project. He's doing a documentary about weight training and how it helps people in jail. And then, you know, he's telling him, you know, we see the prisoners get really better when they're lifting the weights and I need to get investors. And Joe Weider told me, you know, you could invest in the movie and it'd be totally fantastic. And, you know, all this. And my father says, well, I'm sorry, Arnold, you know, I'm kind of like tied up in the stocks right now and I don't really do that sort of thing. And he's like, hey, oh. Lance, before you give me his response, did, did Arnold throw a number down like I want 100 grand or something like that? Or I don't he... think it got to that part really. No. Okay. But just okay. like he wanted investors for the project. Right. And, right. My, and you know, this is the, the uh, and my father, I guess, turned him down. So, in 1979, this is. The I, by the way, I want to a little here and there. Joe, great member. Joe, Joe is 72. He's like the rock. I don't, we don't have to go to Spain because he's the rock at your Thank you, Joe. You so great. you got to hear his Eastwood. He's it's not that good, good. but uh, thank you. When Eastwood called so, Arnold, let me finish or I'll lose my momentum. Yeah, but uh, so it's the third year. It's 1979, uh, and I go to the Olympia again. But this year, my dad, uh, he couldn't make it, so he sent me alone, and my, uh, I had a friend of mine with me, a, a friend of mine. So I said to my friend, ah, you know what, let's go backstage. Arnold knows me. He always lets me go backstage, so it's cool. So I'm wandering around backstage and everything, and Arnold comes over, and I figure, oh, I'm going to say, and I go, hey, how you doing? And I'm about to introduce my friend, right? He goes, what are you doing back here? You're not allowed back here. Get the fuck out of here. Get out. You know, and he like throws me out of the backstage area. That's acts crazy. like he's never seen me in my life. And he just like, and I, my friend goes, oh, you know Arnold. Sure you do. Yeah, right. And I'm like, no, I do. He goes, he didn't know you, you asshole. And, you know, and it's like, so, uh, so I'm like sitting there racking my brain. Why did he act like this? And then it hit me like this was the message to my dad like your kid can't go run around backstage if you don't invest in my uh my project so then uh as you know i do a lot of crank phone calls and i had oh, arnold's john was at Arnold house after he won the usa and class was there and you know jack neary and and Weeder, and, and John was walking down the hall. John, I'll, I'll, I'll do justice because we've done this interview a couple of times. So John is standing there looking at the Conan store at Arnold's house. And he's like, wow, I can't believe I'm here. And this is amazing. Uh, yeah. this is in the hall. I'm not going to try to do his voice because I suck. He goes, hey, let me see your calves. So John had great, you know, great calves, great everything. He had just won the big title. And uh, he throws him a big old calf. And Arnold's like, ah. Ferrigno has better calves than you, and he just kept walking. And, you know, John was like, a, I don't know. No, he said, I no, what he, what he said to him was, ah, those calves are no good. They're up high like Louis. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. They're high up like Louis. <laughs> <laughs> but I did get a little bit of revenge on Arnold. But With, so uh, I had his, I had his uh, office number. And I would fool his secretary into get putting him on the phone. I'd call up like Joe Weider, different. I go, "Hello, this is Joe Weider. Uh, can I speak to Arnold, please?" And and she goes, "Sure, Joe. Here's Arnold." He go, he go, Joe, how are you? How's it going, Joe? And I'd say, "Well, it's great. How are you?" And he go, "Who the hell is this? This isn't Joe Weider. Click, you know." And then I called up one day like Clint Eastwood. Oh, let's hear so that. I could, I could really do that one good. Let's hear it. Yeah. Uh, and he gets on the phone. He goes, Clint, and I said. 
listen, I'm making a movie. And I thought that you'd be really good for the movie. And I know that you're starting to be in films and I saw you in Stay Hungry. I thought you were really good. And he goes, wow, this is fantastic. He goes, you know, I've always admired you, how you direct movies, how you, uh, how you, you know, you, you've been in, you do directing, acting, you're like my hero. And I said, I'm just kidding. I said, you aren't any better at acting than that, that damn orangutan I just was in a movie with. You hear? And he goes, who the hell is this? This isn't Clint Eastwood. And I would like call all the time. And then finally they, they caught on to me, but uh, I kind of hang up. I didn't want them to know it was me, but what am I going to say? This is for kicking me out of the uh, backstage, you know? That's a ball, you know, to do that. It's too bad you I did. Did you? I did record it, and I played the tape so many times it broke. Oh. Yeah, I recorded it. Right, I had played it for a lot of friends at school and all of that. <laughs> and this is before, you know, he was in a lot of, like, even Conan or any of those right. movies. Oh, oh, okay. He'd just done Stay Hungry and stuff like that. So. <laughs> like, Zane, 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 you know, Arnold Zane, 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 and he's going to text or other, but when there's no time, it's not good. Not good. Not good. It, yeah. So getting so back to my father, it became a problem at one point. His eating style, and it was holding him back, but... And how did you become so proficient in nutrition and nutrients and supplements, Lance? Because you're one of my go-to guys. Well, just, you know, a lot of reading, a lot of experimenting, uh, just things that work. I've tested lots of things, different diets, different nutrients. Uh, just, you know, always got that early influence to be healthy from my dad. Uh, he always stressed really that... You know, if you take care of yourself and you're not on a dozens of medications, if you're not just really not was never big on the medical route, you right. know, like unless you, you know, like I had my appendix out. That's something that I don't think you can kind of heal yourself. But, you know, it's just by being in tune with your body, you know, listening to when it's telling you things are off, making adjustments. Uh, I believe if you're not deficient in any nutrients, you're a lot better off. Uh, I think a lot of supplements are garbage, but, you know, there's certain basic vitamins, minerals, and things. And, yeah, you can get them in your food if, in a perfect world, but with today's, with the soils that are leached of minerals and vitamins, it's not always that easy. So I think some good supplements as far as nutritional supplements are, are important. Uh, and just... I do blood work. I do a lot of things and just really keep track. I've been pretty lucky not to have any issues so far. I was going to reference the leaching of the soil and, you know, the food inherently has less nutrients. So, yeah, balance it out. It's important to get blood work done. But getting back to Pablo, so his body care, how did you end up doing a guest posing uh, uh, duo in tandem with him? That was fantastic, as Arnold would say. How did that come about? Well, there was a promoter that did a lot of the shows that I used to go into. Yeah, John, John, uh, John's trying to lure you down to the chat tank. He's trying to be nice and lure you in. You know, just when you were out, thought you were out. Thank you. Said you're looking good. Oh God! <laughs> I have no, more to show their arm. You know, they all have they all have terrific arms. Look at that! There you go. It's obligatory. <laughs> Dennis's arm is looking gigantic. I mean, he's still got all his muscle. Uh, I know. Uh, he yeah, says, thank you. Uh, yeah, Frank Dalto. Was, I was going to say Frank Dalto. He said it before me. Yeah, so uh, he just kind of got the idea. He said, you know, right, what, who, who, who is Frank Dalto? He's a, he, he was a guy that ran a health food store, and he also started putting on a couple of these bodybuilding shows. A nice guy. He'd pl promote them, okay. like the Mr. West Palm Beach and the Sunshine State. Right. Classics and you guys all yeah. trained. What gym was that, that you trained? He at? still does it, as far as I know. What? What's that gym you guys all trained at? It was like that smaller. Uh, what was it called? Um, what was the gym you trained at? It was like a small club back. Oh, then. where I did was called Palm Beach Health Studio. I trained there for a little right. bit. Right. John right. was training people at I think it was Palm Beach Gym in Del Rey. I'm pretty sure, or maybe he can clarify. But yeah, that might have been my uh, daddy. Yeah. daddy oh. And he might have been in your contest. Yes, he emceed the one that me and my father guest posed in. Because if you hear the video, he's the one 
introducing us and everything. Okay. And he had not yeah. the whole show. But uh, so, yeah, he asked. I hadn't competed in several years. And uh, he just said it would be really cool if you got up and, like, posed with your dad. And that's when I did that whole little skit with the thing that you saw. That was really cool. And uh, it just, uh, it, to me, it was kind of neat because it was a little bit of a challenge to look reasonably good in a few months when I hadn't been really at it for a long time. And, how did the, how did the uh, audience, uh, were they receptive to it? Yeah, I think it was really entertaining, and I think some people can apparently tell me they still remember it today, and this is a long time, uh, because it was really different. It wasn't just us getting up and posing. I put a little story into it, which is an old decrepit guy coming out with a nurse, and you hear this, and you hear like this kind of scary music and this mad scientist saying, and that's me, I did the voiceovers and everything, saying I'm ready to test my new youth hormone. It's called stranobolin. <laughs> so I mixed, you know, Stranahan with one of those Prima Bowl yeah, 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 type. Yeah. So there was Stranabol, and he, he's testing it out on my father, who looks, you know, he's got a cane. You saw it, right? Yeah, yeah. And he gets the injection, and a few seconds later, he's posing like Superman. And so after he finishes his routine, he goes, that's incredible. Let's up the dose, you know, let's give him yeah, more. Course. So he gets another big dose of Stranabol, and... Don't want to waste the syringe, right? So he, oh, 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 yeah. and then he, he de-ages into me. And that's how the, you know, the lights come out down and then I come out and I'm supposed right. to be him de-aged and I pose. And then we both came back out for an encore and did some shots. And Did your, did that, did that your father, he like, you love doing that or? Yeah, I be, but it was difficult to get him to, you know, I would choreograph a lot of his posing because that's something I was pretty good at was posing. Yeah. So I had to get him to like, because when we're doing it together, we were trying to match the shots at the same time with the music. And that wasn't so easy for him. He had just gotten in a car wreck a few months before that and really hurt oh, his man. leg. He would, you know, I told him he probably shouldn't go in the thing because, uh, and he went in it. John said it was like, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's like you it's like you beating two colado in eighty eight there, John. Took yeah, you all Troy, the He hung in there. Yeah, the USA he hung in there. Troy looked really cut in that. John was on he had a seven year I think John, what was it? A seven year you took a seven year break uh from from competing. You still trained hard and you came back and you won. Ordinarily you go on that long, you know, it's all about the judges seeing improvement year by year. You know, I think what John looked like that year was, you know, just fantastic. Perfect shape, the, you know, small waist, that much mass. I mean, he that was really, uh, I think he really nailed it. And uh, it's a five year. I would say for a vacuum, vacuum pose, it would be him, Zing, and. Uh, I don't know if there is anybody else who really hits it really well. I think, you know, his vacuums is as good as Zane, but maybe even more impressive because at the same height or maybe a little, he's even a little shorter, I think, John, than Zane. He's carrying like 40 pounds more muscle, you know. Yeah, it's different, it's different in a different way, I think. Uh, they're equally, you know, it's it's tough because Zane hits that and still has the chest. John does, too. The world people, I mean, nobody hits it, but uh, yeah. nice try. Thank you, Lance. Um, John's going to come on in a few days. We're going to talk about some things that are going on. Um, your father, let me ask you about your father, Lance. The, the world that he came out of probably still has friends in the golfing world. And maybe, I don't know, my impression, some people think they're a little elitist, maybe they're not. What did they think of him? Dirty in his palms, lifting the, the, the cold steel bar, posing on stage. They think that was kind of a waste of time, or why are you doing this? What's this all about? Especially at his age. Did you get any of that? Maybe he didn't care. Well, I mean, when he was posing, he's that's when he was in his late sixties. Uh, I didn't think he was in touch with too many of the golfers then. I'm sure Gary Player would have approved of it. I think he heard about it and did because he was always into fitness and he was a good friend of my dad's. Right. Uh, you know, they thought he was crazy when he lifted weights when he was young on the golf tour because nobody was doing it at all. And they didn't really do it except a little bit that Gary did, but they didn't do it till Tiger Woods. That's almost 50 years later. 
So, I mean, when you're doing something and nobody catches on until 50 years later, you're pretty ahead of the, your time, you know? And a lot of the stuff he, he did is popular now, even though I didn't agree. I told you he did the fasting. Yeah. You yeah. always hear about that now. Right. Uh, right. I didn't really agree 100% because he'd go 10 days with no food at all, just water. He this was is one good. of the things he got into later in life. And like in his 40s, he just he would go 10 days. He believed this would help him live much longer. He had a lot of books on longevity. I think, you know, and then they were all big on this fasting. And he would lose a lot of weight. I mean, he would only weigh 150 to start with, and then he'd be like 130 after that. Lance, how, would, would it just be a sheer force of will that he would be able to function for 10 days without food, without any calories? You know, I, I just think once he made his mind up to do something and he believed in it, he would stick with it. And unfortunately, he would do that sometimes when even something to me wasn't showing really great results. But that's his commitment was like, I'm going to keep doing this. And the only thing I would have said, the one little thing I would have told him is, hey, you know, if you're not seeing the results, you can always change your program. And this was something I think that stopped him from being probably the best golfer or one of the best in the whole world is at the time that he was at his absolute best. He was on the tour. He was winning every tournament basically he entered. And this is probably in the early 1950s. And people were saying, you know, Frank Stranahan, he just finished second in the Masters. Uh, all, I mean, really doing well. And a guy uh, like a swing coach of like a lot of famous celebrities, uh, this guy named Alec Morrison, convinced my father somehow, because he was like a real charismatic guy, to change his swing. He said, you're on the verge, but I can take you to the next level, Frank. I can make you the best golfer in the world, but you have to do exactly what I say. And my father, for some reason, who was playing great at the time, why would you change anything, right? He allowed this guy to like revamp his golf swing. And this is kind of the swing I was taught by the same thing, which when Jack Nicholas saw me, by the way, play golf one day, I was playing with him and his son. He goes, oh, he said to my dad, oh, I see him. You taught him that Alec Morrison system. You can see Jack, right away. This is Jack Nicholas saying it to you. Jack Nicholas said it. He said it to me while he and my dad because he saw my swing and it was a kind of a an unusual golf swing. You pick the club up, you'd reroute it. There was all this stuff. And my father, after he switched to this swing, I don't think, and the, and the record book shows that he didn't start winning quite as many tournaments after that. And he turned pro after that, and. Uh, he never switched back. He stuck with it because he always believed, you know, in this guy and this system. So he got really like once he believed in a system and he would just stick with it. And that's the system I was taught, which I don't think was the best system in the world. But I'm just saying he did that with a lot of things. He liked the fasting, the, the diets. And it was like, hey, maybe this isn't working. Maybe you ought to like change back. But he was like full bore once he decided on something. But one of the most disciplined people I've ever seen, I mean, as far as just raw discipline. And I'm disciplined at times, you know, when I've had a goal and I'm like, but to have that sustained discipline every day in and out, uh, I, I have a ways to go to match. I, I, I got to do that too. Uh, John said, you know, John's going to come on. John's been struggling. So John was listed by Flex Magazine as the fourth hardest trainer ever. So he has his pain tolerance, but he has shingles right now. And it really kind of crippled him. And he's going to come on and talk about it, and, you know, just tell people what's going on because people can benefit from I, it. I guess when those, you know, those nerve endings get affected by this, it, it's got to be, you know, if you've had any kind of neuropathies that are the painful kind, they can be just brutal. And, and this thing sounds like unbelievable for him to even say it's painful this well, you know, guy, yeah yeah you could parallel him with ronnie coleman in a way one of the big areas of the problem with that is it's, it's constant and constant chronic pain becomes part of you where it it it, it enters into your bio feedback it tells you who you are and the danger is to get used to it but you're really getting used to a lower quality of living and it could literally change your personality. I don't think you can 
happen, but you know, he says it's the worst pain ever that he can't function for four hours without food. So when Lance and I come down to train with Shark Tank, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't um, uh, we shouldn't fast, right, John? And he says seven weeks of shark tank. John, we're gonna get you on. How does that affect the uh, why? Why does not eating affect it? Does it make? Oh no no. He was, he was just talking about how you, you reference your father not eating. For 10 oh days. oh oh. Low on the, on the draw to get that. John, John, give us some info, but I'm going to ask Lance our five questions that we always ask our guests here. Uh, so Lance, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to mention five things, and it, they could be a question or a statement, but you answer briefly or, you know, whatever comes to mind in explaining. you okay. me. So I've got one, two, three, four, five. And people don't know, Lance has a, a background in film production and acting. He's done a lot of work in that, and he has a lot of knowledge there, so we've got some stuff in here. All right, number one, John Defendant. Oh, you want me to say something? Yeah, whatever. <clears throat> when I say John Defendant. Well, uh, an incredible champion, incredible bodybuilder, incredible trainer of champions, uh, a great guy, and my friend. Excellent. Uh, number two, I'm going to name four movies here. Say what you will. Shawshank, Pulp Fiction, Green Mile, Goodfellas. Yeah, I've whatever, seen all of them. Well, whatever the best means, what would be the best for you? That's kind of, I know it's kind of garden variety, but what, you know, what strikes you the most out of those four movies? What, which one is the best? Shawshank, Fiction, Green Mile, Goodfellas. Well, the one I've probably seen the most times is Goodfellas. I really like that movie. Uh, as far as a, a good film that makes you feel redeemed would be The Green Mile, and then, of course, Shawshank Redemption. Uh, I didn't see those as many times, and I saw them quite a while ago, but I remember they had a great impact. But Goodfellas... Every time it's on, I usually catch out a little bit. I, I and and uh, what was the other one? Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I've seen that a few times too. That's a fun movie. It's got a lot of good moments in it. I think I just quoted a Samuel Jackson here, and I will swear, English motherfuckers, speak it. <laughs> That's a great meme. Uh, number three, Frank Stranahan, your father. Oh, like I said, the most disciplined person that I've ever met. Uh, a very good father. Uh, great champion. And uh, I miss him a lot. He left a lot behind. I like to say, that, you know, people like that made a dent. They made an impression. You know, they left something behind, you know, whereas you know, a lot of people, they just come and go and they don't leave anything. Number four, Def Leppard or Metallica? <laughs> <laughs> well, jeez. Uh, I'll tell you, like, I liked, uh, there was an album by Def Leppard called Pyromania. I love it. Uh, that I really liked. I remember training to it, uh, playing it in my car. And then they had the one the uh, following year. I think it's Hysteria or something. Yep. But it was more commercial. It was more of that hair metal. And I thought they went into kind of a wimpy direction. Uh, and I liked a lot of hard bands. Metallica, I liked. I particularly, and this is one a lot of people don't like, I like that Black album that they had all the videos for and MTV. Uh, even though it was heavy, I thought it was very melodic. But I, I liked them. I think that you go to the last concert you went to recently. Did you go to the last concert? Queensryche. Oh, Queensryche. I love Queensryche. I should have, I would have asked, let's add them. How do they measure up? Would you, so we're talking the list. Well, I liked them a lot back in the day, you know, the yeah. 80s and 90s. and uh, Silent uh, Lucidity. Yeah, I like a lot of that. Um, you know, I used to walk on my crutches. I was on those crutches for years, and I used to listen to that style of lucidity on a loop. It was like a dirge, like a funeral dirge, and I would just walk around town with long hair, real 
skinny and I had this dangling earring and I was on morphine. I looked like a murderer who, who would get killed by a little kid because I wasn't good at it or something. But I used to listen to that. And I don't know. It's it kind of song. drove me nuts. Number five, uh, Arnold or Stallone. And why? And before you answer that, we've got John right here. Some kind words about your dad. An incredible, eccentric madman on a mission. I will take that. When I hear eccentric, I take that as a compliment, you know? He was definitely eccentric. That would have been a word anyone would have. How would you define that? Why was he eccentric? Like, how do you define that? In what way was he eccentric? He did things his way? Or... Well, well, for example, he didn't care what anyone thinks and would sometimes, like, wear things that might be a little unusual to go out in public to the grocery store. Like, for example, when he was doing his running and you're running 15 miles a day, your, your inner thighs, especially or if you're wearing shorts would chafe. Yes. Uh, this is back then. I see people wearing this outfit now, but they didn't back then. So we would wear these like white tennis shorts with black leotards and like a kind of a white shirt. And then he didn't like the sun beating down on his neck while he was running. So he'd wear a visor, but he had sewed some sort of towel in the, top and to the back that looked like kind of an Arabic headdress. I love it. And he would walk into the grocery store with me and my friends from school, they would, you know, say stuff and the parents would go, he's eccentric, you know. That, so that word John used, eccentric, would have fit in because of stuff like that, you know. I bet you. And, and, and then we'd go to restaurants, uh, you know, early evening and you remember those little tiny shorts we used to wear, those little yeah. spandex things? Yeah. yeah. So he'd wear, when he got into bodybuilding, he'd wear the little spandex shorts with those stripes. That's and we'd awesome. go into a restaurant, I'd always be cringing a little bit. Like, I, bet you, in the end, I bet you he was oblivious to people. He just did it. Oh, he didn't it, care at all, you know. It didn't even register, right? It so, I mean, there was things like that that you'd consider a little essential. Oh, yeah. Uh, it reminds me uh, kind of. The way I dress, and you know, I get flack. Um, but on, <laughs> I on, told you that you would have fit in very well with it. Yeah, you, you gave me a great compliment once. You said your father would have liked me, and that was a great that was a great compliment, man. I don't know in my in totality, maybe some certain aspects about me, you know. I think he would have for sure. Uh, I love that he existed. I love that you're here to carry your, you know, you're his genetics. You know, you, you've got some of his genetic matter, and here you are right now. And, and you know, it's good. It's, that's why I love doing this, because, you know, you and I understand. You and I remember certain pages from 1976, Muscle Builders. You know, you, you can mention the title of something, and I can remember the picture. But we're able to talk to these guys. I can even remember stuff in Weeders Magazine with John in it. Yeah, they, you, they you, have those pages that were kind of yellowish. Like, in the, in the back. back. And I think it was him winning Mr. Western America or one of those shows. Oh, I knew it said Up and Coming or something, John Defendus. But I no, remember. It was, it, was the, it was the AAU scene in the back, and Defendus was doing a hands on hip pose, and he had won the Mr. New York as a teenager. He won the teen and open division. And it did say coming up. And I'm like, you know, Defendus is like maybe five or six years older. So I was a teenager, and I'm like, and I'm always looking at guys like Pignoli and Defendus and Gaspari. I'm like, how, how, how am I going to do this? You know, and I saw the and I'm like, well, you know, it's like when I failed my first chemistry test in, in college. I got like a 32, and the class average was 85. And I'm walking away. I'm like, well, I can't be a chiropractor. Let me figure out what I'm going to do. Of course, I kept trying. But yeah, we, you and I remember that. And we're able to bring these guys here. And, and get that history because they were there, and it's important to do that now. It's like a time capsule because you and I appreciate that. And you know, there's young people now, they don't even know, they know Arnold might have been muscular, they don't know that he was a competitive body. They think like The Rock is a better bodybuilder than Arnold, and they just don't know, and they don't care. And I don't know. So, we're able to do that through you. I thank you. He says, Stranahan is legendary, and I agree, and that's why we're spending time on him. So again, Arnold or Stallone, my friend, my southern bound friend. Oh, yes. 
Well, you know what? Uh, I'll tell you, I think I liked some of the Stallone movies a little better. Uh, you know, I liked some of his films better. I think, uh, I think he seems to be a nicer person in some ways, maybe more integrity in some ways. I think Arnold, uh, is, uh, you know, he, he was the type, I think when he was coming up that if you could do something for him, he would probably hang out with you or something. But then that, besides the guys that he was friends with, that he worked out with. But I mean, I think I see him more as like a, a user type of guy, more predatory and Stallone. I feel like you could have a better, I may be wrong. I don't know him that well, but it's just the impression I got. But oh, wait, uh, wait. No, Joe, I've got a joke on this. Joe, he could definitely do a Stallone impression. He harangues, he sends me these recordings <laughs> of Stallone talking. Like I don't know that. if I can do it right now. I swear, if I didn't know it from him, I would think that it was Stallone, yes. Hey, yo, Michael, absolutely. How you doing? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. No, I can't do it right now. Dude. Hey, Lance, um, would you agree? I think that Arnold is really uh, an, uh, a movie star versus not so much an actor, whereas Stallone actually has better acting ability. That's just my opinion. Would you? I mean, he writes his movies. You know, he's won an Oscar. Uh, well, you know, like let's say for an example, you're watching a, a good emotional scene in Rocky or you're seeing uh, something really intense in Rambo or something, there's just certain, like, I get a more of an emotional impact from some of the Stallone performances, for sure. I'm not saying he's Laurence Olivier or anything, but there's that certain, like, intensity in those movies, especially some of the violent stuff. Like, Arnold will shoot somebody and he'll go, hasta la vista, baby. It's always very, like, it's funny, there's a catchphrase, yeah. you know, like, uh, you know, hang in there and he'll stab you and hang you up against the wall. But Stallone, Stallone is like when in that Rambo and he goes, I'm coming to get you, Murdoch. And the lightning strikes and you just feel the goosebumps go up you, you know. Or when he's saying something to Adrian and it's just more moving to me. He can play the, those, those parts in a more convincing manner to me. Whereas Arnold is just more, you know... Arnold's got a style, and some of his stuff is good. I, I think he's great in the Terminator films, where he's a robot, and uh, and uh, and there's been a couple of things he was good, and he was good in Twins. I mean, he's, he's, he's but I'm just saying for that intensity, I go with Stallone. I would say. I bet I bet we can do an awesome Christopher Walken. He already sounds like him. He does have quite kind of that low whispery you know uh <laughs> you can work on that lance you know well, lance, I, I don't know i met like john defenders he's <laughs> mr usa you know that's very good <laughs> <laughs> right 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 there man he's like Adler. you know i caught a little flack the other day lance well, i put a, a picture up of arnold went from a few years ago with his bicep and now he's a little sagged out but I, I only reference because he's supposedly trade, uh, tra uh, he's eating vegan now. And you look at the shape and compare it to Stallone's shape. What do you make of that? I mean, do you think Arnold let himself go and he could be in better shape because Stallone, you know, is always like a razor and they're about the same age. I think there's a year's difference. Do you think it matters anymore? Or I think Arnold's at the point where if they want him to get in shape for a movie, you know, because he, he, he can always, I think, do what it takes to, you know, in a few months to look good for a film, even probably at this age. Yeah. Although he did have another heart issue a while back, and I think he's maybe a little reluctant, I don't know, to train too hard or go. But I, I've seen him just a year or two ago with his son where he was looking pretty good. But yeah. some recent, very recent pictures, he doesn't look like he's training and maybe he's got some issues and that I don't think the vegan diet, if he really is doing that, is helping uh, a lot. You know, I think you and I've discussed and maybe you'll agree, the vegan, you, you can, it can be healthy, but it's very, it, it's very, I don't want to say hard, but it's very involved. 
to get everything down right to get all of your nutrients. That's all there is to it. And I don't think people you know, when, they, when you get to like, and then again, I am very impressed with people over 60 or now even like them over 70. If you can keep going, you know, and stay in shape 70, 75, and you can do it without anything deleterious really to your health. That's very impressive because that's not easy. That's not it's easy. Not. It's not. I'm not really impressed with these dime a dozen guys in their 30s and 40s. No. Yeah. Uh, Stallone is an amazing writer and actor. He understands how to capture the heart of an audience. That's true. Very gripping. I'm probably not going to make my uh, peak this year. Uh, I usually try to get in pretty good shape on my birthday. Oh, the, the birthday I, I've actually been making some progress, and I don't want to start like dieting super hard right now. I'm not fat, but I feel like I think for my 59th birthday, which will be the next one, I'm going to try to get in really, really best shape of in the last 20, 30 years. You know. You know, I was talking to my business mentor Ben Altadonna, and uh, he's in great shape. I think he's almost 60 now or 59. He's out in California, and I was telling him, I was mentioning to you, I have this, you know, condition where I, you know, I get these hemorrhages. I, I'm probably going to steer clear of weights, maybe from now on. Uh, but I have enough muscle that I think I can maintain. I'm going to try to find something like yoga or maybe some type of cross training, something where I can offer a challenge. But to me, my health comes first, and maybe it's not so important uh, to be shredded like i get every year or you know maybe i'll get shredded but there just won't be as much muscle maybe i'll be happy with a different version you know uh it's got to be congruent with feeling good because i need to have a clear head and feel good like you may gave me a compliment when we first started talking hey you look happy energetic I'm like well it's because i'm talking to you and i mean that because we have a good connection and all that and when i do things i like but it's not like that all day. I wake up, and that's my worst time of the day. I wake up and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, overthinking, and I got to pull myself up from that. Uh, but it comes down to the better shape, and you, maybe you agree, the better shape I'm in, and I'm not there right now because I missed my birthday mark this year, uh, the better I do at everything, you know, business, money, relationship. Uh, John said, uh, oh, boy, and then we lead to this. Just when we're trying to be easy on ourselves, want a challenge, Shark Tank, baby. <laughs> I, uh, I think when I'm really going to hit a peak pretty, you know, and upcoming, I think I would want to go there. I would want to. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah. I, uh, I, I would definitely. Because even though I missed out when I was competing in my younger years, uh, there's no reason why. I, and I've seen what he can do for an older person like my dad. There's no reason if I wanted to absolutely attain my best shape instead of thinking uh, I can do it all on my own again, like I always do. I would like to to the, definitely have that expertise this time. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna compliment John. One of my greatest compliments I think I could give. He is the real. This is in caps. The real thing. Like 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 Jack Lane. Meaning, John's always the same, whether you agree with him or not. He's always he's a constant, and um. I, I don't want to be an old man, and the thing you want to re uh, avoid is regret because, you know, I did all these things I wanted to do, train with Kaspari, Bill Grant, you know, all these different guys, and, and you certainly have, you know, run the bases on all that, and I, I want John to be included. I've, I've got, I don't want to miss the shark tank. I don't want to be laying there thinking what a pussy I was back in uh, the COVID days. <laughs> you know, got to get, got to get, listen, you know, what's going to happen? We're not going to get uh, some kind of laser surgery on whatever's ripping in you and then go up. Yeah. To... You know, it's like that guy from uh, uh, The Hangover. What does he say? The, the Asian guy. Did you die? But did you die? Did you die? Well, you and I are sitting here talking right now, everybody who's listening. Worst shit's already happening. You're still here. So you didn't die. You can overcome it clear goal you'll get it as long as you keep going man that's what i say that's the only thing that sustains me i'm still here because it's easy to quit you i'm going to tell you if you quit and your father would probably say this maybe not like this but he'd say if you quit you are a pussy <laughs> <laughs> i don't know he probably wouldn't say that but you know what i mean i think you pretty much articulated that right he said he, he was a guy who just kept going no matter what right, right? And you got some of that. You grew up with that. So how can you – now, how many kids grow up without a father? Maybe your father was kind of hard. My father was hard on me. I, I still think you turn out better if you've got 
you know, father figure and a tough one in the house. I tell you what, I'm wanting to really be hard on myself lately, and I want to really accomplish something, and I want that discipline, and I'm craving something or doing something, and I don't, I want to stick, stay on my plan. I evoke his memory, and I say to myself, you know, you know, well, you came from this person, or even stuff my grandfather did, and all that, and say, you know, I, I, I feel like, man, you know, you are not. You can't not live up to having that kind of standard, that ability to do that, and you you should have that in you, and you I have you know shown that type of thing many times, but it, now I feel like I'm at the point where I want to have that a lot of discipline most all the time, you know, and I but again what's very clear and what he was very important is that you have to know exactly what you want, you have Usually. to know. And you mean have a very clear cut goal. If you get ambiguous, oh, I sort of want to do this. You know, I really like if this happened. Wouldn't it be nice if this happened? It's like, man, you have to define like what, what, what quantity, what exactly do you want? And and I didn't re I never had enough of that. I sort of wanted to be a good bodybuilder and look impressive and win maybe the Mr. West Palm. I sort of wanted to dabble in some acting and some films. And one of the real tragedies is there's like I, I was pretty good at a lot of these things right away. And I can think of like six or seven areas that I just like. And I'm glad that I had all those experiences. But it would have been nice to have been like, because I guess my brain would work that way, to just focus and like on one or two things and just had a very clear cut goal. Like this, this is it exactly. Because I have no doubt I have the discipline and the drive. And now I'm starting and I feel, wow, you know, I'm 57. It's a little late to have that kind of focus, but it really isn't. I mean, I feel pretty youthful. I feel healthy. So I've got a lot of goals now and I feel like I'm I'm more excited now than I was when I was younger. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in the same, I'm in the same place and, and I've had people approach me in certain things that I've run, endeavors, and they'll come up and, and they'll say, well, I'm kind of thinking about, I'm like, I can't work with you because right there, they're already talking themselves out of it. And you and I don't have any time to convince anyone. If you've got somebody who's like a zealot, even if they're wrong, and but they're wrong with confidence, at least they're focused and they bought into it. And that goal is coalesced in their head. And then you could attack it and go for it. And John says, we'll have some fun. See, this is where he's being at Sven Galley. He's trying to lure us down. He's luring us down with just some training. It's going to be food, fun. Food we'll lab. Training. Food. Food There'll be lab. food. There'll be laughs. You, you talk about memories. I'm talking about scar, scar tissue in the battlefield that will be my mind. But then he says, Frank Stranahan's words, one heaven. When Lance gets there, if you if he doesn't do a Shark Tank workout, Frank's going to say, what the fuck is wrong with you? You didn't go to defend this. Now get back down there. He didn't say that, 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 that last part. <laughs> Hey, John, we really, we really hope you're feeling better. I'll talk to you offline here, and uh, I want to get you on here. Maybe we could do a, three, you know, if you want to come on with John, uh, Lance, later on in the week, because we're going to talk about his, um, uh, what's he, what's he suffering from? Uh, Shingles. Yeah, and you know, fighting that and still working and training, and a lot of people have those kind of, you know, painful issues. If you want to come on with them, I think that'd be fun. I've been wanting to do like a, a, a trip. A, I look at his shoulder surgeries this last year or so. He's had two shoulder, of them. I think he had shoulder replacements, didn't he? Shoulder replacement, yeah. Then I, I think they had to do it twice. Yeah, I mean, he, had to, he had to have a redone. And Joe, wonderful. yes, I, I made a mistake. I said Joe was 72. He's really shredded wow. like a rock at 75. Yeah. In the, and the mindset has always been huge for me. Joe, he does Joe have his country songs pretty good. He's one of the guys that Joe's a really good guy. He helps animals. He sings. He's got yeah. his little tunes that he puts up. They're good. He he makes me happy when Joe comes on. Uh, shingles. I'm sorry, John. Uh, the shingles are attacking. They're attacking your shoulder replacement. Well, listen. We'll talk. We'll talk uh, in met, uh, because I know Lance has to go. Oh, really? They're attacking the shoulder replacement. Yeah, how is that happening, John? It's uh, I would I would have thought that was healed by now, but it can get in there and do that, huh? Uh, Jeez, it's something you have to defeat, man. You know, you've always got to keep kicking, no matter what. It never ends as long as you have viable life on this planet. There's a there's a line from The Grateful Dead. I'm not a big fan, but the the line goes, uh, just when you think you're on easy street, 
danger is knocking at your door. So don't don't relax, man. <laughs> don't relax for too long. Uh, and Lance, anything else you want to leave us with anything uh, about your dad or what's going on? Or uh, Joe says, hope you're well, of course. No, uh, I think we got it pretty good there. So I want to thank you. It's always fun. We're going to get down there again to see you guys. I, you know, the issue is we would have already been down, but it's nobody wants to fly. I'll fly. I don't care. They don't want to be in like a tube in the sky sitting next to people yeah, and, I don't people and all that. Are your gyms open down there and everything? Is everything coming back or? Yeah, they they're they're open pretty good. They they have some machines where they've kind of roped them off so you can't get too close to everybody, which is good, uh, I guess. And uh, you have to wear a mask when you go in, but apparently when you're doing your exercise, you don't have to. Yeah, I guess the virus knows when you're pumping up not to come around. You know, the virus but, uh, the virus is an amazing thing. It's very selective. You know, we won't we won't really go there though. Uh, You've got goals. We know you do, John. Uh, but anyway, uh, I want to thank you, Lance. You're a good friend and you're a good person to know. You're a great contributor and your your experiences are rich and informative. And uh, um, I wish I was you in, a many, in many of those experiences with Menster and all those guys growing up. That's cool, cool stuff. Uh, I'll let you go. I know you got something going on at eight and uh, I always got to wonder whether I'm in trouble or not when I'm going out this door with whatever might be going on. You know, we got dogs, we got yeah. Denise. I don't know what's going on. You know, I'm in here a lot. But uh, thanks again, man. I'll, I'll send you a co copy of this. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, I know I scheduled it today real quick, uh, but you did me a solid, so I want to thank you, man. It was nice of John to come on here and contribute so much. Yeah, and John wasn't John wasn't sure. He said, "Great talking. Uh, I'm here when you're ready. We'll talk about that, John. Maybe we'll do it by the end of the week." Uh, what's Thank the? Thank you here, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, John, we need you. We need you to be good, John, to be solid and viable, because uh, many. Uh, it's this 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 phrase I use. It's not literal, but millions will die if you falter or if you're weak. You're certainly not weak, so. You know, millions die. They don't die. It's kind of metaphorical. But, um, you know, many people look up to you. So you cannot falter. You've got to find a solution. And I know you will. Great show. Thanks, Joe. Thanks Thank to people you. like you. You know, we, we, keep, we want to keep really good people around us. You're only as strong as the people you're around. I mean that because I'm a guy in a room alone most of the day. So I have problems with that. <laughs> all right, Lance. <laughs> Next time we come down, Denise and I were talking. We're not going to make you come all the way to Miami. We're going to we're going to come to your hood or maybe meet you halfway. So you got to find a restaurant. It's fine either way. We'll try that one John mentioned, Mario's and Boca. And bring Boca it up. Hey, I never I never say no to Italian free food or money. That's what my mother advises. I said I don't I don't know who's going to give me free food. Thanks again, Lance. Tell Maggie a good hi. Thanks everyone. I'm going to have a uh, who do I have coming up? I have um. I have uh, Robert Nylon. I've got probably John Defendis and Lance coming back on. And a few other people I have in Roy Callender, uh, a bunch of other people, some mainstream people too. So hopefully we keep rising and disseminating good information and making everybody a little bit better. So thanks again. Have a great night. Lance, I'll talk to you on Messenger. All righty.